Today in the studio, folks, I got a real treat. As always, Phoebe Dupre. What's cracking? Hey, Brad. Phoebe is going to mesmerize you with her incredible story. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I was talking to my friend who knows you, and they said, she, you do have a credible story. So I wanted to go back and figure out what it is. Now, first of all, folks, if you guys don't follow her, Instagram? Uh, Phoebe.Dupre. Phoebe, that's P-H-O-E-B-E dot D-U-P-R-E-Y. Phoebe dot Dupre. You're going to want to follow her. Plus, if you own a business, right, and take credit card payments, you're going to want to listen up because I'm telling you right now, that industry is rot with, I wouldn't say criminals, just opportunistic individuals. I refer to them as white collar psychopaths. White collar psychopaths. Yeah. Now, now. All businesses take credit cards. And if they don't, they, they're going to need to. Yeah. Like I know a pizza parlor in New Jersey. They will not accept credit cards, cash only. Yeah, that's because they don't want to pay taxes. Whatever it is. But like, you know how much business they're missing? Yeah. You got to take credit card payments. Yeah. So Phoebe is the big boss and founder of Real Merchant Services, which basically is a merchant solutions company for businesses to accept all forms of payment, credit cards included. But anyway, we'll get to that. I want to go back to your story. Mm -hmm. Now, number one, you're not very old. What are you, 30? 33. Okay, so 33 years old. Where are you from originally? Um, I'm from Connecticut. And you grew up, what, rich? Um, we weren't rich. Um, we weren't like you know, super poor. My mom took care of us, um, for sure. You know, both my parents worked and took care of us. What is super poor? Uh, super poor is... Did they buy you a car? No. Did you get, like, did you go on trips? Um, we went to Disney World. I went to New Hampshire. Yeah, we went on a car. Okay, so you weren't trips. super poor. Yeah, no. The reason I ask is because, like, you know, if you get a car bought for you, folks, your life wasn't tough. If you, if you went on trips during the year, like to Disneyland and shit like that, you weren't, you weren't, things weren't tough. Cause you hear a lot of people talking about how tough shit was and it really wasn't that tough. They were just either entitled or came from a rich family and their particular, you know, line wasn't. But when I say poor, I'm talking about no money, uh, no trips, no cars, no allowance, yeah. Barely any school clothes. Were you that? No. I mean, my mom worked at a bank. Um, my dad always worked like three jobs. Um, so, you know, my parents took care of us. We weren't like super rich, but we weren't like. Are you nervous? Yeah. Now, why, <laughs> nervous. Why, why would you be nervous? Uh, you know, you're nervous the first time you do everything. So this is my first podcast or like my first thing like this. So I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, long story short, you, you grew up in Connecticut. Yeah. Tell me about your family. You want to hear a story first about my first car, now that you brought it up? Yes. I bought my first car for $1,800 um, with my own money. So I had dropped out of high school. Now all I wanted to do was work. Um, so I worked at a pizza place. I saved my money. I saved like $1,800. It was like all I had. I bought a car, but it didn't have like a finish on it. It almost looked like it was matte. It was like a 1998 Honda Accord. Um, but the guy who owned it lived by the ocean. And I think the ocean over all the years had like worn away the shine. Anyways, and then I ended up the windshield wiper, like, you know, the thing that changes the windshield wiper was broken. So I could only turn on my windshield wipers by sticking the fuse in like through the bottom um and my car was so bad that when i like i had gone out on some dates with guys and i would park like five blocks away from the restaurant because i didn't want anyone to see my car because it was so ugly it also it also had like a crash mark in the front so like one time this guy was uh took me out on a date and then wanted to walk me to my car and i was like no it's okay no 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 and i like begged and pleaded him like not to follow me because i didn't want him to see how shitty my car was that's hilarious yeah but you had a car, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, so Maddie was telling me, like, way worse. Yeah. This. 
So I'm glad we've clarified. Yeah. You had at least a car that yeah. you bought for 1800 It was a shit box, though. No, I, I've um, worked my butt off my whole life. So I've always had multiple jobs and I've always had money coming in. And But why, though? That's what I'm wondering is, is I already know that you're a hard ass worker and you yeah. built a great company. My question is, like, what drove you to that? Um, I mean, I I don't know what initially drove me to that. I I mean, my, my dad always worked a lot, so maybe he instilled some, like, work ethic in me. Because my, my dad is the kind of guy who had, like, three jobs and never took his vacation. He'd always just, like, cash it in. Um, so probably from, you know, probably from seeing that. But I didn't really have anything. Like, my you know, my parents took care of us, but they didn't, like, have anything to give us beyond that. Like, had to buy my own car, had to get my own apartment. But I got pregnant. Basically, the day I turned 18, I got pregnant. And I left uh, my mom's house immediately um, at that time. Why? Yeah, at that time. So my mom loved dogs and loved to foster dogs. And she had nine dogs in Damn. our living room. We had like cages in our living room, right? Like out of love, I guess, for my mom. But we had like a St. Bernard in the house, like all the way from a St. Bernard to tiny dogs. And when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, there is not one more living thing that can fit into this house. What would your dad say about that? Um, well, my parents got divorced when when I was in fifth grade. So my dad wasn't really around for that. Did he hang around? Um, you talk to him still? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you still talk to both parents? Yeah. Okay. So she's like the opposite of a cat lady. She's a dog lady. Yeah. So my, my mom was a dog lady. So as soon as I found out I was pregnant, um, I went and I moved in with my kid's father. And then, and then, uh, he turns out to be kind he of a... He turns out to be just... I don't want to get into it too much, but a disgusting person. So um, he almost, we ended up breaking up. Um, I don't want to say this because I don't want my daughter to hear it, but he didn't want to have, we had my first kid and then I immediately got pregnant after. Um, so I had, I got pregnant when my son was just about five months old and he didn't want to have our second baby. And I was like, well, you know, maybe you're not having a baby, but I'm having a baby. So we started breaking up immediately. I moved out, was on my own. Um, he was there initially, like my daughter was born. But then after that, I didn't really, you know, I mean, we were so young and he was kind of like, you know, the guy who sold the pot and like, I, I don't know why I thought it was cool and I thought it was a good idea, but then I ended up getting pregnant. It was kind of just like a stupid fun, like, you know, when you're young and making mistakes. Um, then he ended up being my kid's father. And like previous to that, I didn't even call him my boyfriend. He wouldn't let me in the house alone. I ended up getting pregnant and like abortion was not anywhere. He, he wouldn't let you in the house alone? Yeah. He why was, not? I don't know. I don't even know why. I don't know why. I, like... I but think, but knowing you now, yeah. you're like far more intelligent than that. Why wouldn't all those be red flags? So I couldn't figure out for the longest time why red flags like didn't go off in my mind. And now that I'm with Brian, the, I, there's an analogy. Like I watched him cook and he, he is really, really good at cooking. And I'll watch him like if he wants to see if the pan is hot, like he just goes like this and like touches the pan because he cooks so much and like his hands have been burned, right? So many times that he doesn't have the same feeling as anyone else. And I was like looking at him do that one day and I'm like, okay, I think that's what happened to me that, you know, you have so many things happen in your childhood where like, it should be a red flag, like, hey, you guys shouldn't be near these people or be doing these things. And when you aren't taken away from it, I think it just doesn't feel like it's bad eventually, right? Like it just doesn't hurt. Like you just see it as like being normal. Like you can touch it and you're like, oh, whatever, I've touched that before, right? Like it doesn't hurt anymore. And so, I, I think, you know, after I grew up and kind of got out of like the bad cycles that I was in, I think that that's what it was, that it just didn't like, it didn't set off in my mind as a red flag. It, my mind didn't say like, hey, this isn't a good place to be. Like, you need to leave. Like, hey, that person isn't good to be around you. You need to leave. It was just kind of, I, I don't know. It just, I just accepted it, I guess. Probably because you were a mom now. Mama bears have new instincts. Well, even when I was a mom, I still went through about eight years of, it's like, I always worked really hard. I was always a really good mom, but the people who I let be close to me, I didn't have standards for them. And that that's another thing that I've learned too, is that having standards for the people who are around you is like one of the, <laughs> it's, it, I think is the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to raise your standards about who you allow in your life. Because I used to, I, I think that I had like such a low self-confidence because I dropped out of school. So I felt embarrassed anytime I saw someone in my town. I had kids early. The person that I had kids with turned out to be a disgusting person. He got, um, 
he, he's not their father anymore. So like we went to court. Now, when you say disgusting, is it, is it like, like, what do you mean disgusting? Cause I, that's a, that's a word that makes me think like, was he, was he like, yeah, uh, I don't really uh, did want... he, did he like to uh, dissect dogs? Like what made him so disgusting? <laughs> God, I don't really want to say it because like it involves more people than me. Um, so, so he, so he was a dirt ball. He is a person that you just would never want to be around in your entire life if you knew who he was. And it, does it take you a while to know who he was? Because you you, you 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 humped him. Yeah. So he must have been nice in the beginning. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was 17 and like smoking pot and like drinking and just, it was kind of just, it wasn't. No, but like, I'm saying like when you guys first got together, shit was normal. Well, like I, you boyfriend, girlfriend type relationship. He wasn't disgusting from the get go. Yeah. And you just look past the disgusting things. Yeah. So he, you realized this guy's a freaking dirt ball. Well, I, I think from, you know, when you grow up, if your family is like, you know, your family uses drugs and like, you don't have like this, like strong family structure. You don't have people that like set standards for themselves around you. I think you just naturally match what they do. And so I just thought it was normal. You know, mm. like all my cousins, my, my uncles were in jail for like. Um, like attempted murder, like beating people up for money. Like, you know, everyone around me was just like using drugs. And I just think that like, you know, now I look back and I'm like, I don't know how I ever even just didn't think twice about those things. But then you get put around other people who are like that and it just feels like normal. Like I I just thought, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I, I look back and I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking, but it, it's like knowing what I know now and like changing my standards and like, just making sure that everything in my life is like for me and benefiting me and like the relationships that I have are like good people. Looking back, I would never associate with those people. I would never do the things that I used to do, but I just didn't know any better then. What made you think, or, or if someone else right now is in those situations, what would you encourage them to do? Well, so like, you know, I currently have friends and family members who are in abusive relationships. And like, I've been in relationships where it was like, kind of bad or like kind of rocky and then when it then it got really bad and then I left right away but I'll see people who are in relationships where you know like people are like hitting them like all you know their their boyfriends are hitting them all the time or like punching them in the face or like and, and I'm not they, even and just, they stay and they stay and I'm, I'm not even just talking about one person like I know multiple people and I'm like why why like I just I can't even fathom staying in it like I've been hit by guys before I got up and left right so like I've been in three pretty bad relationships and I kept saying like it has to be me because I'm the common denominator right like and people used to say these things like oh like these stupid quotes like oh you accept the love you think you deserve I was like I don't think I deserve this I was like how is that quote true like I don't think I deserve to be beat up but then I just realized it was just raising your standards like you you literally have to have the mentality that's like if someone does this to you once that's it like they're gone like there's no like if someone hits you in your face like they hit women right if they hit women they'll hit children they'll hit animals like there's they have like no like moral compass. And so I try to teach that to people now, but it's really hard to get someone out of that. Like when you're in a relationship with someone who's super abusive, it, it doesn't always start out that way. Like whenever it starts, they're always really nice to you. They give you gifts. They're always like very affectionate. They're calling you, texting you. And you're like, oh my God, this guy's so great. And then slowly they start to turn. And it's like it, the, one of the guys that I dated, like, he, he didn't do anything in a pattern. Like it wasn't like he drank too much or he used drugs or he hit me. It was just like every once in a while there would be like weird shit that happened. And I would be like, oh, that's really weird. And then it wouldn't happen again. And then something else weird would happen and then it wouldn't happen again. And I'm like, okay, are they stressed out? Like try to figure out what's going on with them. But like, you know, I know what drug addicts look like. I know what alcoholics look like. But like I have like dated psychos and I couldn't figure out for the longest time like why it kept happening. So did you figure it out? Yeah, I figured it out. Why Why did it keep happening? Oh, because I allowed it to. <laughs> I know, it sounds crazy, right? No, I allowed it to. Like, the first time that someone does something shitty to you, uh, you should leave. And it sounds you tolerated so it. Yeah, I tolerated it. Yeah. 
And and I also was like, you know, I'd make excuses for them. I'd be like, oh, well, they must be stressed out because of this or this is going on in their life or, you know, like whatever, whatever it was, like somebody passed away or they got a divorce two years ago and they're not over it or, you know what I mean? Like whatever the thing I always used to be like, oh, well, you know, they must be doing that because they're so stressed out, like give them another chance, like trying to be like nice. But the reality is, is that like no one should ever treat you like shit because of anything going on in their life. Like that's just it. See, folks, life isn't that difficult if you just keep it simple. And why did you allow it? And you, it's like, you know, that's why you did it, because you tolerated that shit. Yeah. So then you got away from old dude, and now he's in prison. So you got away from dude, but your kids are still dudes. What would the court say about that? Um, no, you have, so, do you have to have visitation and all that? No. So my kid's father got his uh, parental rights taken away in, it happened in 2016. As part of being disgusting? Yeah. Dang. It happened in 2016, but he hadn't seen them for years before that. So he hasn't seen them since they were two and three years old. What if he ever wants to? He can't. I know he can't, but like, would you ever allow it? Oh, no, never. No. <laughs> no I would literally, no more tolerating. I would, I would run him over with my car if Damn. he ever came near me. Yeah. Damn. So, yeah. so. That's a bummer for him because now he he loses out on his kids. But guys, there's consequences to this shit. So so anyway, normal people would like be all distraught and shit. You kept going, so you put your kids in school. Now, now where are you at when you put your kids in school? Connecticut. Yeah. Do you have a boyfriend? Um, I did have one boyfriend after. You know, so like I was in court for my kid's dad, like it was a very rough time in my life. I was working two jobs. So I worked at the casino from nine at night till five in the morning. And then I went and bartended from 10 in the morning till five. So my mom would watch my kids at night while I worked at the casino. I'd go get them by six, get my kids on the bus by eight. You know, then my daughter had to go to preschool. Um, and so it was this constant, like every time I sat down, I would just fall asleep because I never got more than like three to four hours of sleep at a time. Um, and then what was your question? I don't remember. Um, I'm trying to picture the, <laughs> the, the scenario. Oh, my, my second. So the guy I dated during that time in my life just ended up cheating on me. And like, I knew he was cheating on me, but I couldn't prove it. Right. Like I could never like tack it down. Um, Isn't that maddening? Because you suspect it, but you can't prove it. So you so you want to believe it's not true. Yeah. And then you have someone who's telling you that you're crazy every day of your life, that you're crazy and you're insecure. And like, I'm going to tell you, uh, all the women out there, if you ever feel insecure about something and your man is pointing out and telling you you're insecure, he's a piece of shit and you should leave him. Because what if you are though? What if it's like you are a psycho and you are full of shit because the person's not that way and you and he's trying to help you and by telling you that he's just trying to help. Well, you know, I don't know what to say to those people because I've never been I actually like I've never been in that situation where like, you know, I've been stupid, right? But I've never been the malicious, like I've never cheated on anyone. I've never been like hurtful to someone. Like I always had like these stupidly good intentions with everyone I've ever been with. Why do you say stupidly? Well, because I had no, like I said, I had no standards for myself. So it's not that you shouldn't trust people or you shouldn't love people, but if people show you who they really are, like you have to believe them, right? Well, and do, you, so, do you feel like that experience caused you to change the way you treat people? It changed the way I tre treated myself. Mm. Yeah. Because I have a saying about that and yeah. it's like nice people that get burned a lot end up like becoming assholes and, you know, vicious and they, they change. Yeah. So what I say is you don't change the way you treat people. You just change the people you treat. Yeah. And that's it, it, exactly. Um, and so I haven't really like changed the way I treat people, but I just have smaller, like a smaller circle. You know, it's just like my kids, a couple of friends, Brian. Do you think you have any trust issues? Uh, I mean, I think I do, but it's not, I don't want to say it's trust issues. Like I feel bad for Brian sometimes because I just tell him now, um, this is the way it is. If you don't want to do that, then I can't be in a relationship with you. Right. And it's not like, yeah, but that's what like gets most guys going, damn, I like that. I like that. <laughs> no, but you're showing it, strength. It's not like, like for example, it's the like, takeaway clothes, Phoebe. <laughs> 
What? It's the takeaway clothes. Yeah. Like, like, like if I just went home, my my wife says, babe, if you don't do this, 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 we're just not going to be together. I'd be like, where's that coming from? Obviously, because we were married. But if she'd have said that in the beginning, I yeah. appreciate shit like that. I think yeah. a good dude does appreciate shit like that because at least you're telling them, here's the boundaries. Yeah, exactly. And if they listen to you, then you know that they're a really good guy. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, when Brian and I first got together, like, Brian was single for years before me, right? But, like, his Instagram, like, sorry, Brian, but his Instagram had, like, a bunch of hot girls on it. Like, every regular guy, right? Like, every regular single guy. And I remember telling him, like, listen, I don't like looking over and seeing, like, girls' butts on your phone. Like, it just makes me feel weird. I don't like it. And you know what he did? He deleted all the girls. Like, he just was like, oh, okay. I got, I got it and unfollowed all of them. If I said that to a guy that didn't really love me and like didn't appreciate me and like didn't want to be with me, he would say something like, oh, you're so insecure. I yeah. don't have to do that. Like stop, be, you know, just putting like insecurities back on me instead of saying like, yeah, I guess you're right. Like I, you know, whatever, I'll take them off and just take them off. And then like, I'll see like some of the people that like have husbands or in long relationships and like their entire Instagram that they're following or like porn accounts. And I'm like, do you guys sit next to each other on the couch and there's like nipples on your guys' page? And like, you're just like, okay, that's fine. Hmm. It's like awkward to me, right? So like those kinds of things, <laughs> like. <laughs> well, if you can't give your spouse your phone freely, yeah. I think there's something wrong. Yeah. Just FYI folks, if you're out there and your spouse won't give you their phone, like, no, I'm not giving it to you. Like adamant they're not giving you the phone you, it's time I, to go i would say there's something wrong with that situation and yeah. and i'll bet you anything you will eventually find out there was yeah because people are like you know i just don't like people in my phone no you're hiding something yeah or your purse like hey let me grab something out of your purse what are you doing in my purse like it's just a bag with shit in it like what it's not your you know ass yeah. it's it's a bag <laughs> like what are you what are you worried about yeah those are signs. Those are red flags. People should recognize. No, they are. And if you like say something to the person that you're, you know, want to spend your whole life with and they don't consider what you say, like, it's very simple to just be like, oh, they make sure I'm comfortable. Like, I won't do it anymore. Okay. So you eventually met a good dude, Brian. Yeah. So up until then, were you single or were you dating? Didn't you um, get to a point where it's like, dude, I'm not attracting uh, or I'm not choosing very wisely. Let me just be single for a minute. Well, I did that. So I had my kid's dad. I had one other guy that cheated on me. And then I stayed single for three years. And then I met the real psycho in my life. And I thought at oh, that, that point. Oh, shit. Then yeah. the real psycho came. Yeah. And I thought at that point, because I had been alone, I was extremely happy in my life. I was like, I just got. Hold on. Your dad, your, your, the father of your kids are dis is disgusting. Yeah. Then, and he's in prison. And then no, he's not in prison. The the psycho's in prison. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know it's hard to keep track. So of the that. so the father of your kids turned out to be some sort of perv, sounds like, and then and then you dumped him smartly, and then you met a guy who's a cheater, which is to me that's normal, normal yeah. guys. Yeah. And then you met one that's truly psycho. Why is he so psycho? What what do you do? Like, why do you mean psycho, psycho? Should I really say it? God. Where's Brian? Um, if he was, if Brian was sitting right there, would you look at him and say, should I say it? And, yeah. And then, what if he says yes? And what if Can he says no? Can you see him? Yeah. Where is he? He's sitting there. He's standing right there. <laughs> Just for the record, folks, he said, it's up to you. <laughs> should I, Brian? Well, what made him so psycho? Um. So he... He wasn't super psycho when we were dating. He started to get weird. Like Jeffrey Dahmer weird? Yes. What do you mean? <laughs> what the hell do you mean? <laughs> I mean, yes. not, not like, I don't know what Jeffrey Dahmer did, but. You don't know who Jeffrey um, Dahmer is? So after, after everything happened, like. Jeffrey Dahmer? He's a psychopathic killer. Well, I know he killer, like killed people, but I don't really and, know. And eat them. Oh. And hump the dead bodies. You know, I, I don't know if it could progress to that. That's but now, but now there is no Jeffrey Dahmer because the inmates had their own form of justice for Mr. Dahmer. Yeah. So Mr. Dahmer is no longer with us. Yeah. Well, I could only pray that that happened. But the psycho wasn't that bad. Obviously, he wasn't a murderer and killing things. But I he did hear he killed your dog. Yeah. 
So, but that's after you guys left because that is psycho. There's nothing for that. But that's like you guys are breaking up. Then he killed. He didn't just kill your dog while you were together. No. So this is what happened. So we, I got introduced to him through Merchant Services, and they were like, "Oh, this kid's your age. Like he, you know, is really good at his job. He can help you." So for like almost. I don't even know how long it was, like a year and a half. We would like talk on the phone sometimes. He never said anything, like he never hit on me. He never did anything like inappropriate. He was just like helping me. And so I, and I actually wasn't even attracted to him at all. I just considered him my friend. Um, and then like one day he told me he was getting a divorce and then he told me he liked me. And this was after like talking and talking for like, you know, like all the time about like work. And he really, he is the one who trained me in my career now, which sounds crazy to say, but I feel like I almost owe my success in the industry because he's the one who actually like helped me and like taught me a lot. And so when he said he was getting a divorce and we started talking and I ended up getting like, I ended up moving down to Louisiana. I said when my residuals, like this is gonna sound crazy, but I said when my residuals hit $3,000, I was going to move because I hated Connecticut so much. My kid's dad was up there. All I wanted to do was move so I could like feel safe at night. So I moved down to Louisiana. He like shortly moved in with me and um, everything was like, I don't know, it was fine. Like, and we were like top sales reps of the company. Like we were traveling, we were closing deals. Like, I feel like from the outside, like he went to church every Sunday. We went on coffee dates every Thursday. We went on dinner dates every Sunday. We worked out together. Like, I feel like from the outside, we looked like the like couple like that you'd want to be, right? Like everything like felt great. He was like super nice to me. He was like always with me. Like, like I said, always taking me out on dates, like buying me, like not like buying me like lavish things, but just like always thinking of me. And then he would just like, kind of like, you know, like just be like off sometimes. Like you get this look in his eye and like now it scares me because I know why he had that look in his eye, but he would just look off, like almost like he was like empty inside and he would like get mad. He would like leave the house. Why did he have that look in his eye? Well, so he was going through a divorce. He had just had a kid. He told me the story, which the mother of his kid is a great person. But when I was with him, he like fed me all these lies about what a terrible person she was, how she didn't take care of his kid. And it was simply like the furthest from the truth. But I didn't know, you know, I, I just, I didn't know. And when you're in a relationship with a manipulative person that's like loving you and treating you right, you would assume that they did that to their last relationship, right? Yeah. Like it would only be natural to like believe that. You're like, well, you're so nice to me. Like, how could you have been like a terrible person? They must've been the terrible person. And when someone's like, you know, when you're doing good in your life and happy and then they're feeding you lies, like, I don't know, you just live in this reality that's like not true, right? And so he would just start being like off. And I just thought it was because like he was getting a divorce or because he had a kid with someone he didn't want to. And like, just, you know, I thought I was like, I probably shouldn't have gotten together with him this early, like, but we were already in it. Um, and so then he just started getting like, he would get like randomly mean. Like he took my daughter's phone one time and like threw it out our, our door and like smashed it, like went to the pool area. And like on, that was like in August. And then in September on my birthday. For no reason? I mean, she was being a child, but like he got like overly upset that like, I, I don't know what she, I don't know. So she the, was doing the flag something, was he got overly upset. He got overly over upset. Over something small. Yeah. And so I told him, like, I started telling him like, listen, like you can't do that to my kids. I, I want to break up. Hell no. Yeah. Like I want to break up. And then that was like end of August. Two weeks later was my birthday. And on my birthday, he didn't do anything. It was my 30th birthday. He didn't do anything for my birthday. And that's a flag. And he, I told him, I was like, you really didn't do anything for my birthday. And he, <laughs> he literally said to me, what would I do? Get you a cake so you can get fat. And I was like, I was like, wait, what? I'm like, am I talking to an alien? I was like, is this real? Right. And so he ended up we got into an argument. I said I wanted to break up. He ended up leaving the house for two days. I don't even know where he went. Um, he came back and I, we got into another argument when he came back. I locked him out. I was like, you're not living here anymore. Um, he ended up pushing through the, you know, like the latch on the door. He pushed through, he, he left his cell phone in the house and I was 
being an asshole and I was like, well, too bad, so sad. And I like wouldn't open the door because they didn't want him to come back in. He ended up pushing through the door. He broke that little latch off the door and he had a pocket knife in his hand and ended up like taunting me with like the pocket knife. And like, but then he would say, then he would then start laughing and say, oh, I'm just kidding. And then he just left. And I'm like, like, I just couldn't even get a grip on reality. But I was like living in Louisiana. I didn't have a lot of money. I was away from my family. I had no friends. So I was like isolated, right? And, like they always say that like psychopaths like to isolate girls. They treat them really good and then they change. And I'm like, what is going on here? So we decided that we were going to break up, but obviously like, I, I don't Damn, know. Damn, like, I thought this was going to be about merchant services, but <laughs> I, but this is getting too juicy. Like we just can't get off of this, but, but my listeners right now yeah. would be pissed if I changed the subject. Yeah. So continue. Do you want to finish? Well, I, I was. I thought we were going to talk about merchant services, and I do want to talk about that eventually. But like, this is too juicy. Keep going. Okay. So he ended up like doing that, and I'm like, "What is going on?" And then he was laughing, and I was like, "Like, I, I just, I, I couldn't. I've, I've never had someone be physically abusive to me. So like, I didn't really. <laughs> Let's understand. take a break for our sponsor. Just joking. I didn't really understand what was happening. <laughs> People are on the edge of their seat right now. They're like, "Brad, shut up." <laughs> And so anyways, we said we were going to break up and I said that I was going to move and go work with this woman who is also in merchant services. And so we were like planning to leave and he had left the house. Um, God, what was it? Okay. So he had, he had like left the house. He was like in and out of the house. And then he came back and he kept saying like, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for how I behaved. I love you. I want to be with you. Blah, 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 blah. Like all abusive men or people do. And so I was like, no, we're still breaking up, but we were like cordial, right? It wasn't like, I, w I mean, I know that that sounds alarming what I went through, but it wasn't like, I was like, whatever. I was like, we're just going to break up and I'll just move on. So I got up and went to work one day after saying I, we were gonna split up. And when I came home, um, we walked inside and my dog was dead in my bathtub. What a and dick. I, I had a hundred, he was like 90, well, almost, I don't know, between like 90 and a hundred pounds of pit bull. He was the sweetest dog. He was like a teddy bear. So like you would think like, how do you kill a pit bull? But he literally, and so like I had a camera in my house that was like in my living room and it was, I had a gym in my house. So when I went to the gym, um, I would like, my kids were like eight and nine or nine and 10 at that time. So I would leave them in the house while I went and did like cardio or whatever, but I had the camera. So if they were arguing, I could like hear them, but I had just gotten the camera. So like, I didn't realize that it like held video. And so when I came home, like the dog was in the bathtub, the door was shut. There was like blood on the floor, blood on the bathtub. My kids were screaming. Like it's literally on a video. It's like my worst nightmare. And I'm like looking and I'm like, what the, f I'm like, what the fuck happened? I'm like, did the dog have like some crazy medical thing? I'm like, I'm like checking the back door. I'm like, did someone break in and try to steal from me? And they were a psycho and they like killed my dog. I, I called him and I was like, the dog is dead. I was like, come home. And he's like, oh my God, that's so crazy. He comes in, he starts we did business with 10 vet offices, like veterinary offices. He's calling the vets, asking them what could have happened. They're saying crazy medical things that could have happened. And then I'm like, what if someone broke in the back door and like did, did something to the dog? So I start looking on the video and I'm like, I'm like, you, you killed the dog. I'm like, what the fuck? I couldn't even believe because like you can get in arguments, someone can shove you and you're like, okay, th we're done, right? We have to break up. Like this is getting weird. But like, you never think that you're going to come home to like a dead animal. And I'm like, how, what kind of person can kill an animal? And I'm not talking about hunting so you can eat it for all the hunters. I'm talking about like, dude, how would you kill a dog to get back at a girl? He, what he did was, so we got an autopsy done on the dog. It, it's just the whole thing. is just like disgusting. Um, we had to carry the dog out of my house in a black bag. And like, dude, it's just, it's just so like my, my son and I went. How many years ago was that? That was in 2019. Damn. So that's fairly recent. It's yeah. It's still pretty. Yeah. It's still scary. Um, so where's homeboy now prison he's in prison right now yeah but so he's in Do you guys have weapons in the home in case he's listening yeah. is brian afraid to use the weapon no are you no good no dude i'll blow his brains out i bet you would i bet you would <laughs> i hate to say that but it's it would either in that situation Did you kill my be, dog like that it would I'll either blow your be him out. or me like the first thing i thought was like that could have been my kids yeah, right could have been could have been
You're lucky it wasn't. Yeah. And and I'm like, how? I'm like, how? How, how could a person seem so externally successful, right? Like, I was literally recommended by people to work with him. We were, like, awarded. He was sales rep of the year at my company. Like, I think people thought highly of him or thought he was a good guy. So what if he came and applied at Real Merchant Services? Would you hire him? You, you can't have felonies like that and be in merchant services. Oh, so he's so, so you busted him then. Yeah, so he he pled guilty um, for killing the dog. Yeah, and that's what, it's obviously not murder like normal murder. What kind of charge do you get for killing dogs? Uh, so Donald Trump actually made it a higher like penalty if you hurt animals. Yeah, uh, actually, right before go Trump. That, yeah, right before that happened. So, um, but. Right before it happened? Yeah. Like, oh, so, he's, so he got the no, but business he, he, end of things. No, but he really didn't. The, the judge that worked on the case, I ended up having three judges on the case, and the first two judges held him with no bail, which they don't even hold like murderers, attempted murderers, right? Sometimes with, with no bail. But when they saw what happened and like what he did and, and- So what did he do though, real quick? What, how did he kill the dog? He, um, so when we got the autopsy, the dog had like burst- uh, blood vessels in their eyes. He had blood coming out of his nose. Um, and then he had trauma down the back of his throat. So basically what they, they called it, uh, non drowning asphyxiation, something. So basically in, in the video, he comes back, he's like balling something up in his hands before he goes to my dog. I think he was balling up. Like, I don't know what it was like a towel, like a hand towel or like socks or I, I don't know what it was. He shoved something down my dog's throat and then he threw it in the bathtub and let him suffocate for about 25 minutes. And you can like hear it on the video. And in the video, he just keeps walking back and forth to go see when the dog is dead. When the dog's dead, he pulls the thing out of the dog's mouth, throws it away, washes his hands, goes to work and tells me how much he loves me. Wow. And for part of it, I was on the phone with him because I was down the road at like a, a business, like trying to do an install and I was asking him a question. So I'm on the phone with him and on the video, you can hear him talking to me and hear my dog scratching in the bathtub dying. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man, there's some trauma. <laughs> How do you handle all this like nonsense in your life? Cause you seem very calm still. Well, so after that, like it probably took me a good like four months i i don't know if like anyone i understand ptsd now like from going to war and stuff because like after something like that happens to you it's very weird your body goes into this like i don't know if it's like a survival mode so like everything around you seems overwhelming like lights sounds like you can hear i, I don't even know how to describe it like you can hear every single piece of like equipment or like doors or like and so you get like extremely overwhelmed after that for probably two months i would just sit in my closet like in my oversized closet and just sit in silence because like i would sit the apartment complex i moved into there was a stairwell we lived on the top i would just sit in the stairwell because no one was there and like no one could ever no no one was there and like, I couldn't take any sounds or anything. It was just so overwhelming. And so I think that must be something like what men who go to war or something like when you see such terrible things, like your body just can't handle any kind of stress or anything for like a long time. And so after I kind of like just coached myself out of that, like, you know, I talked to a therapist and stuff. And then I decided that there was only, there's like two decisions, right? So I could say to myself, men are bad, right? And like, all this was for nothing. And I, I really, I was only making like $5,000 a month then. Um, and I could say to myself, like, this is the end of my story. I'm going to be a depressed piece of crap and like not be a good mom to my children. Or I could say, I don't accept anything bad in my life anymore. I'm going to win. I, I remember vividly telling myself, like, dude, this is not the end of my story. Like, I'm not going to be like the loser who let men like abuse me and then didn't do anything with merchant services. Like I didn't move across the world, go through all this trauma, like, you know, and I, I took my kids with me, which I felt so guilty about to just end my story there. So I ended up just like doubling down, working really, really hard. Um, I 
have had new standards for guys in my life, right? I said, like, I'm only going to be with a guy who's obsessed with me, loves the kids and I, wants to marry me, like, is will do anything to love us. I literally said that in February, and then in March, this guy DMs me on Instagram. and Out of the blue. But you guys have known each other forever. Yeah. Yeah. Why so, did he DM you all of a sudden? You know, um, he had been, like following me on Instagram for a while and like he would like pop into my inbox maybe like twice a year but I never responded to him was he has he was he starting out like the others all nice and shit no like Brian is like <laughs> Brian is a really nice guy Brian will turn out to be the king psycho no 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 Brian is a really nice guy from a really nice family he's like very good looking and like in high school like I never talked to him because he was like Mr. Popular and like you know like I think like the hottest guy in our high school and like I just was always like why is he talking to me this is so weird like he's like hot and like has a normal family like why is he talking to me i would just like ignore him um but he he messaged me and then i ignored him again i was like he called me pretty in uh, on a how dare he on a picture a picture of me working in like a turtleneck sweater and like called me pretty and I'm like this is weird and i went to bed and then i ended up having a dream that i married him and my dream was like that he was the nicest sweetest it was like the opposite of a nightmare right like i woke up and i was like oh my god it was like the best dream i've ever had you could call that a premonition but so i messaged him at like seven in the morning i just had the weirdest dream about you and then when i got up later i'm like it was like why did i text him that and anyways we've been talking like Every single second ever since, he's honestly one of the nicest, sweetest people I've ever met in my life. Well, that's the best where it all begins to turn around. And then and yeah. then you built a hell of a company. Yeah. So, which by the way, folks, is merchant services. As I thought we were going to talk about, let's talk a little bit about that because yeah. I know you have flight to catch. Yeah. But everything you just dropped, I'm telling you, there's people listening that are in those situations that's more helpful than saving them a few points on their credit card. So I'm glad we went through that. But what about the business owners out there that are getting raped in credit card processing fees? I didn't realize it when I first started looking into this that it's like the Wild West. Whoever made you the deal could have made you a better deal. They just didn't. And so because I'm a business owner, I don't really know what the rates are and all the you know interchange plus and all this crap. So literally you almost agree to anything and so you could literally overpay drastically and i would bet you out of the 25 million businesses in this country small businesses i'll bet you anything that at least 60 percent are overpaying if not 90. and if they're not overpaying they're probably underserviced mm. <laughs> so if yeah. you're not overpaying well then you're underserviced uh, the reality is in this business, you right now, you don't need a license to be a merchant services agent. So I could hire you and tomorrow you I could, thought you said they don't do felons. Well, so it, it's, you know, as, as far as I know, it's up to a company's discretion who they want to hire. They, if they look at your record and like you had a, a DUI 12 years ago, but like you've had like success since then, a company might hire you. Yeah. If they look and you had three DUIs in the last year, they're going to be like, no, this guy's a liability, right? And they won't hire you. Um, but besides that vetting process, anyone who wants to be a rep can just sign up and be a rep. And there's barely any training. Um, and there because there are no licenses to pull, what happens is that it, it allows space for for people to do whatever they want, right? So a rep could go out and sign your name in a contract. A, a rep could go out and say, like, hey, your rates are going to be at 2%. They sign you in a contract. 30 days later, your rates are at 4.5%. You're locked into a five-year equipment lease. There's nothing you can do about it because you signed it and the time went by and then that's it. And so... It, it so it's just, a so it's a wild wild west. It's it's yeah. whatever whatever goes. Yeah, and so with that, people or business owners do get taken advantage of. They get promised things, and then when the business owners complain to these big companies, the big companies are like, "Well, you signed the contract, and and that's it, right?" And so there's good companies out there for sure, and good reps out there, and then there's really bad ones that that give the rep, the industry a really bad name. So how would people know cuz I got a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners listening to this, how do they know if they're getting wacky whack whacked? 
Well, um, if you call your agent and they don't pick up on their cell phone, not a good agent. Um, if you look at your your statement and you look at your rates from when you started and then where you're at now and they've gone up, not a good company. Um, in my opinion, if people sign you into equipment leases for equipment that doesn't cost a lot of money, not a good agent. So, so what if someone just emailed you their statement? Could you look at their statement and tell whether or not they're getting double dogged? Yeah. So do you want to give out your email? Yeah. Phoebe uh, <laughs> at Real Merchant Services. P-H-O-E-B. All you got to do is get your statement wherever you get it. Take a screenshot of it or send the actual statement. Email it to Phoebe and you will answer back and tell them if they're getting whacked or not. Yeah. And if they're getting whacked, obviously Real Merchant Services can help them. Yeah. So folks, all I'm saying is it's free. Shoot her an email to see if you're getting double dogged. Now, some of those fees can get pretty high, but you're processing a lot. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, if you're a big company or a small company, yeah. you, you, you're out there helping all kinds of companies. And by the way, folks, all that story leads into now she's built a massively successful merchant services organization. She's looking for reps, by the way. Um, so if you guys want to get into that industry, you can make a lot of money and it's recurring. So if you're interested in becoming an agent, go to realmerchantservices.com, right? And if you're interested in getting the, the services, right? You're, you're, you're a credit card processor or not processor company that takes credit cards, go to real merchant services. Is that where everybody goes? Real merchant Yeah. Folks, just like it sounds real merchant services. And something I want to point out is why I'm so passionate about the industry is because, you know, I have gone through obviously a, a, a lot of trauma or events that like if I had to work a normal job during all that time, if I didn't have residual income, I don't know what the kids and I's life would have looked like, right? Like I went through something tragic and I was able to take four months off because I was still getting paid every month. I still picked up the phone for my clients. I, I didn't necessarily go out and look for new clients during that time. But you know, once you build your residuals in this industry, you can, if, if you're a woman and you're like, okay, I plan on having a family in five years, let me build my residual income for five years. And then I'll still take care of my clients when I have a baby, but then I can still have income coming in. Like my whole thing when I got into merchant services was because I was a single mom and I'm like, I just want a two income household with one person. Like I don't wanna have to go get a guy because I need money coming in or because I need someone to help me pay half my rent. So what I eventually did was my residuals replaced my car payment, my rent payment, like all my bills. And then I was like, oh, all my bills are paid. And if I need to take time off to go see my kids at school or go see a concert, like I can do so and no one can tell me that I can't and I'm still making money. So it, it's residual income. Like I didn't even know what residual income was until I was 26, sadly. Um, but it, it literally changes your life because you're no longer tied down to answering to someone else. Like you do have to answer to your clients, but you can answer to your clients anywhere. You can answer to your clients on vacation. Yes, you can. And crazy part is, is you developed a whole training system. So if somebody's out there, single mom, uh, a dude that's, you know, hasn't really found his way yet. Yeah. This is an industry you should consider. Yeah. And especially because you can do it part time or you can even just refer agent or refer customers to you and get paid. Yeah. So if someone knows someone with a business, loves your story and says, hey, Uncle Joe, I want you to use Phoebe. Mm hmm. And Uncle Joe switches, that person would get paid. That's called a referral agent. Yep. So people can become a referral agent where you're just giving out names as you cross uh, opportunities and make residual income for the rest of your life or the rest of the account's life. The rest of the account's life, yeah. Or you can go as a full time agent and technically build your own company within Real Merchant Services, yep. being kind of the umbrella. Full training. What kind of money can people make? So we have referral partners out there that let's say they've been working with us for about two, two and a half years, just sending over a couple deals a month. They're making $25,000 a month. Wow. And they don't do anything. All they, they did was- introduced you. All they did was introduce me on a phone call or a text and that's it. Um, Damn. I mean- Well, that's, that's only because you're the one doing the servicing and the closing. So, yeah. so and keep in mind folks, th this matters. You might think to yourself, especially if you're familiar with the industry, well, I already have that with this other company. Why would I switch? I already know Joe Blow and whatnot. Folks, 
how you take care of the customer is what's important. You can get a deal, start making commission, and then that deal gets switched because number one, the rates were too high. Number two, they weren't serviced very well. Yeah. You know, so at the end yeah. of the day, you're taking care of customers for for the referral agent. Yeah. It, it's almost like too good to be true though. Because like there's a lot of single moms, people getting out of the military, they don't know what to do. And this industry is burgeoning. It's like ready. And I'm telling you right now, I think it's going to explode with with people realizing that because recurring revenue is so important. Mm -hmm. But it's not really that difficult to get someone to switch because everyone you talk to is more than likely overpaying. And you even have a program now. Listen to this, folks. You got a program now where you can possibly, in a lot of cases, eliminate 100% of their fees. Yeah. So we can set businesses up kind of like a, a gas station where there's a cash price and a credit price. Um, and within that, you're eliminating your merchant fees because you're providing people with two different ways to pay with two different prices. Wow. Well, but the bottom line is you get rid of those fees. And the bottom, yeah, I've saved a business. We saved a business $526,000 a year by implementing that program. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. They've been with us for the last three years. So that's, you know, probably they're probably saving now around like $1.7 million dollars. It's ridiculous. And by, mean, and, you can't yeah. you can't get that from anything else. And not only that, I mean, a lot of people they're doing business, they're not even paying attention. It's almost like a leak. You know, your business might have a leak, and all I'm saying is email a statement yeah. or a call yeah. or go to the website, see if you if you have a leak so she can fix it. Because I want to support the young lady, and I'm sure you do as well. Reps, agents, full training. Best pay plan on earth. Referral agents, best, best again, we'll even train you how to be a referral agent. The, the important part about being a referral agent is that once you refer a deal over, like what we take into consideration is that when you refer a deal to us, we're now representing you, right? So if you have clients and you have a good relationship with them, if we don't hold up our end of the deal, it makes you look bad. So the reason why our referral agents keep sending us deals is because we're on top of all of our accounts. We take care of all of them. All of the people who we service, like we'll tell the, re the referral partner, like what a good job we're doing. And if we do a better job than the last company, then it's just easy for them to keep sending over business. Like if we ever didn't do what we said we were going to do and didn't take care of a client, we would never get another referral again. Right. Because we made them look bad. So we just keep that in mind. Right. That we're representing someone else. So see how life works out, folks. You, you weather the storm like Phoebe did and you end up in the sunshine. You just got to weather the storm. Keep being a good person. <laughs> you can't stop when you're in the storm. You got to keep that's going. Just, that's like what I learned. I was like, you just got to keep going. And then eventually, you know, you got there. The sun will come out tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, whether you're looking for money or you're looking to save money, if you're a business, hit her up. Let's support Phoebe. If you're a if you're a part timer or you're looking to make more money, become a referral agent. Go to realmerchantservices.com uh, and let's support this individual. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Brad. I like your story. <laughs> it's a hard one to share. And let's hope Brian doesn't turn out to be a raging psycho. No, I know. I feel so bad saying that. I feel like it makes me look so bad. But I, I know, know. But when you were describing, like, they're nice to you. They give you gifts. I'm thinking, fuck, that's me. Am I a psycho? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you start to think when, you know, when you're a girl or a person in that situation, too. You start to think that. You're like, is everybody like this? You're like, you get, like, real paranoid at first. But if you just let it go, you know, the right people come around. Well, yeah. we wish you the best. Thank you. We're going to have you back on. We're going to check out our journey. Bomb Squad, listen up to me. I don't freaking do advertising. I don't like do a lot to monetize this. All I ask is if you are a business owner, go support our girl, Phoebe Dupre. Go follow her on social media. And as always, until next time, keep that shit real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.